Hello, it's Wednesday the 22nd of April. My name's Elise Brogan. I'm a GP at Crouch Derbyshire. I'm also doing a fellowship um, with the GP Task Force. And as part of that, um, my, Gail has very kindly agreed to talk with me about the different updates that we're getting each week um, during the pandemic. So thank you very much again, Gail. Do you mind just introducing yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Gail Walton. I'm a GP in Ilkeston. I'm an LMC and GP Task Force exec. I do some appraisal work as, as well. Great. Well, thank you again so much, Gail, for giving up your time um, and re reading up on everything. So one thing I know we mentioned on our video last week was about the death verification process and whether any new updates would be coming out. So could you just tell us where are we now at the minute, Gail, with, with, with that? OK, so I have to admit this week I feel slightly bemused by it um there's been a lot of information coming coming through from the bma rcgp and of course locally from the lmc as well as nationally the lmc's have had a lot of conversations both with the um, chief coroner um and then at local local level i think part of the confusion often arises because the coronial system is um uh, to a, a limited extent led by the opinion and the interpretation of the local coroner which is why the Derbyshire LMC has had conversations um, on a number of occasions with Dr Hunter regarding verification and uh, certification. So there are some clearer guidelines available, like I've said, from the BMA, RCGP and on the LMC bulletin. Um, and I understand hot off the press that the RCGP are going to release fairly soon uh, their SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, on remote verification of, of death. So as we stand currently, and it will change, um, you'll know that by law any um, competent adult can verify death though historically it's often been the GP and I think for us that's brought a few benefits if we've been involved in palliative care for that patient and their family it brings a little sense of closure to us I think but of course we don't need to do that and, and the current guidelines say please think very hard and probably don't visit if it if it's simply to verify death um, there are other healthcare workers who have probably been involved and of course family so that exploration of remote uh, verification is still very much going on and yeah. you may be aware there have been conversations about the funeral directors being well placed to be able to verify death so that is an ongoing conversation within Derbyshire about that, what that would look like what training would be needed what support for funeral directors so it's still very much an open conversation really I'm sorry if I've made it sound more confused than we were before we started talking about it. But it is ongoing, grounded in common sense and kind of watch this space, really. I think we talked about the cremation forms and I think there's clarity on that and certainly on the on the website. Um, and, and the clarity around the certificates being completed and scanned and sent to the to the um, registrar is that your experience i know you were saying off camera that you had to do some certificates yeah i done my first um death certificate and cremation form this week so i was looking up the guidance to do it um to do it with the guidance in front of me and i had uh, it was a COVID positive patient who had been swabbed from a nursing home. So I could write that as 1A um, and then, yes, sent it remotely to the registrar. Um, and then I could do the uh, cremation form electronically as well using um, System 1 with the Arden's template and then could send, send that to, um, 
to the uh, funeral directors directly, which was useful. And then I just went through the guidance on how to fill in the cremation form um, without, I had seen the patient within 28 days using the remote, we'd done a, um, a remote triage of the nursing home, we'd done the, the ward round remotely. So it was, yeah, it was in a way it was useful to do, to do my first one and kind of bring it all together. The only thing that I um, had forgotten but then remembered was because the patient was COVID positive that I do need to inform Public Health England. Um, yeah, so don't need to speak to the coroner, but I do need to, to do that. I think it's like we've said about all of these things, it is changing um, as, we, as we speak almost. So it's about talking to people and over the years I've not, had too much hesitation in picking up the phone and talking to the coroner's office they can sometimes appear, appear a bit um sharp can't they but actually picking up the phone and talking to them even though we're aware they'll be really busy we yeah. can just check if, if our peer group around us at work are, are, are not quite sure either yeah. you know pick up the phone or pick up the phone to the lmc office who are always on the ball with that day's current thinking and guidance yeah and i think that's great advice because most of the time one of your colleagues usually knows don't they <laughs> so, so it's, yeah and yeah. um, the other thing i was just going to mention is we've both seen the, one of the attachments from the lms emails regarding ramadan and mm. both of us work in practices where we've got a kind of low population in terms of ethnic minority but I know there will be practices that would find that really useful so I would recommend having a look at that if you do think you'll see some patients where where that'll be a factor um, and yeah. the other thing we were going to talk about and we mentioned this again last week was um, thinking about recovery and what maybe we should be thinking about um, over the next few months what we your thoughts uh, on this now? Yeah, so we we talked last week. I don't know whether at that stage it was just being flagged up as the recovery phase. Uh, the buzzwords at the moment are recovery and restitution. I had to look in the dictionary for what restitution actually meant. Yeah. Um, definition of it is uh, the restoration or the recovery of something that's been stolen or lost. I thought. I'm not sure that I don't want to go exactly back to the status quo. I want some of the stuff that has changed for the better um, during this crisis to stay with us and, and for us to um, evolve it really. Stuff around remote consulting. Mm. I think we've we've all honed our skills and enhanced some of those skills and, and I want to retain that. But yeah the recovery phase is that awareness of what work haven't we been doing that we do need to catch up with so there's the there's the stuff that should have been ongoing so the childhood immunizations for example um there's the work that then needs to be be done smears being an ex example of that there's things that I think we talked two weeks ago about larks acting versus contraception. So I think I was saying then that as a practice, we'd take the opportunity of looking through our waiting list and working out who was due a coil refit or an implant refit and sending them a letter and where appropriate. Uh, prescribing for example progesterone pills I need to revisit that because that must be another month on now so we need yeah. to, to make sure that we're keeping that kind of stuff going yeah. I think I talked last week as well a bit about the medication reviews we've been doing our practice tends to run quite a lot to birthday month reviews so we were very aware that you know, we've got a twelfth of the population on long-term meds that we need to review. So we've been reviewing those by telephone or video consultations, or in some instances, purely by looking at, at what the medication was, whether they'd had 
their blood tests done sort of just pre um pandemic and and they were okay so that kind of work the huge awareness i think which is becoming more and more publicized both in national media and also we were flagging it up through gp alliance lmc gp task force and ccg comms was the vast reduction in cancer referrals so the figures that were released at the end of last week i've got them here um on average for derbyshire two-week weight referrals for into um rdh around 650 to 700 750 a month mm -hmm. and that had been fairly um, steady from january through to march march the 16th the referral rate had fallen to two thirds by two weeks after that it had fallen to a third and the figures for the 6th of april week were down to 171 so huge huge drop there yeah. i was thinking there's an audit in here <laughs> partly <laughs> an audit. i know from, yeah I, what I'd quite like to do is take a week, say in January, and look at two week wait referrals for myself or, you know, a number of us in the practice. And what's the conversion rate? You'll know better than me, probably. I think, is it something like, I don't know, it's a small percentage, isn't it, of two week waits that are actually yeah. mm. cancer. So are we actually are we referring some people normally on a two-week wait thinking actually i don't think this is cancer but i'm just covering my back um so have we got better at, at managing that risk and and that um sort of expectation of us but even so it's a huge drop so we need to be thinking of ways in which we can ask the question without prompting people to say oh yeah I've, I've, maybe i've got something wrong with me and, and and calling us inappropriately so there's that side of work for practices and pcns to start thinking about too mm. and of course the gp and, and bma and we've um, shared it locally of rag rated the work haven't we that should be carrying on regard regardless in the sense of safe environments to to keep doing stuff and then the stuff do if time and capacity allows and then the other stuff that's absolutely we need to to be carrying on doing mm -hmm. i think it's really interesting to talk to you and kind of hear what you're doing in your practice because I think sometimes we're fat. sometimes triage is really busy, isn't it, in practice? But sometimes you are getting a spare few minutes. And if you had a list of things that that we thought the practice should be trying to to get done, that'd be really useful, I think. And um, yeah, the other thing I had down just to mention was um, a new scheme they've rolled out for Northern Derbyshire, really. Um, regarding eye conditions so there's a very good attachment on the latest lmc email um, and it lists a number of conditions um, including flashes and floaters sudden uh, visual loss change in visual fields there's about 10 different uh, symptoms if a patient calls and has that the gp can triage them and then there's a certain number of opticians that are open and you can give the patient a number and they can call and they'll be re-triaged by that optician and they will either be able to see them or um, discuss treatments or refer them on to secondary care if appropriate. So, yeah. so I don't know if you're going to be able to benefit from that, Gail, but personally, <laughs> I feel pleased. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't sound like it's hit our area yet, but... I think it's just another good example of how we can be working together. Um, so yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, I think the most southern opticians that they mentioned was um, Matlock. So that's not too far from from me. Was mm. there anything else you wanted to mention today, Gail? Or do you think we've covered a, a few of the main bits? I think we've covered the main bits that have come out. I suppose I've got one advert, which is as you're probably aware. Um, 
the cohort of fourth year medical students who are obviously not able to do what they should be doing um a fair number have volunteered to help in in whatever capacity it's been a bit slow in coming through the system in terms of what the expectation from their um, university is and, and what the BMA and RCGP think is, is acceptable. But we're now starting to get names of, of medical students who are available to do some work in primary care. Um, so if anybody was in a practice, there will be an email coming out later on tomorrow, predominantly to practice managers, um, with some more information on. Um, but if there were any practices who were interested in hosting a fourth year medical student, then please say to your practice manager, oh, can you dig that email out of the heap of emails that you've had coming yeah. today? Yeah. Let's have a conversation about it so yeah but no otherwise i think we've covered a lot of the topical stuff to date um the bulletins there there's a lot of useful useful stuff in it and um you know if there's something that isn't clear drop us an email or ring the lmc office we're, we're happy to try and help brilliant thank you so much gail and as always thank you again for your time that's great it's a pleasure. Take care. You too. Bye.